All right, welcome back. Hope you are still here. <laughs> you are, they say you are here, but not all there. <laughs> but we need you to be here and all there. And I bless you with ability to listen and receive and to remember. Um, we can't operate here with normal ways of learning. We, we need supernatural learning here. God needs to help you to open your heart and mind and spirit to, to teach you. All right, next heading there is discern God's will in every opportunity of healing. And that's so, so, so important. Even when just now in a few hours when we're going to pray for you, uh, it's, it's so important that we try to find out what is God's will. And, and normally in a day like this, God is very gracious. He helps us to, 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 to bring healing to many people. And it normally, because you've received the word, your faith level is high, it goes quickly. It's easy. Uh, far easier than going out there. But, you know, whenever you get to someone who's sick, you need to get God's will. You know, Lord, what is your will? And Romans 12, verse 2, has an interesting definition when Paul is talking about three types of will of God. And that helps me a little. I'm not sure whether we interpret it correctly, but it helps me to understand a little bit about God's will because he's talking about God's good will, God's pleasing will, or permitted will, and then God's perfect will. Now, I'm obvious, and you want to have God's perfect will. And for me to make sense in that is, you know, when, when I play darts, you know, when you play darts or you shoot to a, uh, 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 some board, you have a pool in the middle. You have the little one you want to reach. Then you have some circles around it. And if we say the bull in the middle is the perfect will of God, and the circle around it is God's permitted will, and the greatest circle is God's good will. Now, God's perfect will for every person is to be healthy. That's the, the bull. But God permit, allow you to be sick for a season because out of that, he wants to teach you something, develop something, or maybe it's just you are not ready. God wanted to heal you, but you are not receiving. You're not believing. You're not asking. And a lot of people are sick just because they don't receive what they could get. So they're living in God's good will or permitted will. They love the Lord. They go to heaven one day. Everything is fine but they don't experience the perfect will of God in their heart. And that might be with your finance, anything. There's a perfect will, and then there's the, the area where God allows things. That's not perfect, but they allow it to happen. Sometimes we choose things to do that's not God's perfect will. And God allow it while he knows that's not perfect, but he might teach you through your wrong decision eventually to make the right decision. You know, it's like choose a job. You have two jobs. One is God's perfect will, well, another one is God's permitted will. And you want to know which one is the perfect one. Because even if you take the wrong one, God will help you in that. He will support you. It won't be what you have here, but he will help you here. And eventually, after some time, you will discover, this is not really what I want. I, I want something like this. And, and out of that, you might learn or you don't learn. You'd make the same mistake again. But in everything, there's God's perfect will. And when it comes to healing, God wants to heal every person. But what we also need to realize, God does not want to heal every person immediately. Because sometimes you first have to do your homework. So I remember one girl, I was preaching in a big church there in Pretoria once, uh, doing a seminar on a Sunday morning. I was doing the service. It's a big church with about 2,000 people. So I used the opportunity this Sunday morning to call people out that were sick because the previous day in the seminar God healed so many people and in this congregation setting there were so many sick people who came out, many, many, many and at least I had the team helping me like I will have this afternoon uh, some of our leaders they are praying now for you and helping me to just minister And um, so one girl came out and, uh, and that I remember that morning God healed there was a one uh, woman, a lady, 
her leg was about this size shorter than the other one. I mean, she had this thick shoe. And she came and sat in front. I got her to sit in front. And as I was praying, I think we were praying, there was more than me involved, that leg just came out. I mean, she, she couldn't wear that shoe back home. She had to carry the shoes in her hand because it did not work anymore. And, um, but in that same setting, this one girl was standing there asking for, I don't know what sickness she had, but as I stand in front of her, I clearly heard the Holy Spirit say, she must renounce what the parents is doing before I can heal her. And um, I said, I understand that the Lord says that, that you must loosen yourself from what your parents are doing because what they are doing are wrong and that is actually keeping you in bondage in your sickness. Immediately she responded, angry. I will not. And she knew exactly what the Lord was saying. She was telling me, they are in the old apostle church and uh, we are there and I will not renounce that. She, she gave me the answer. I said, it's your choice. If you don't do it, sorry, I can't pray for you. She was so angry. Jumped there and whoom, walk out on me. I just said what I realized the Holy Spirit was telling me because he wants to, to release her. Remember, most of the demonic things and sickness in our lives come from our family. So we need to cut that thing from our family. Most demons in operation in people's lives are family demons. You picked it up from your family. So we need to cut that thing and loosen you. And in her case, it was linked to that because that was what I sensed the Holy Spirit was saying. So there's prerequisites to healing. Sometimes you're not ready yet. It's God's will. He wants to heal you, but He said, first do this, then I will heal you. Now, normally God does not do that with people out there. When we're in the streets, God will first heal, and then He will say, don't sin anymore. But when He comes to the children of God, who knows better, He said, first correct your life, then I will heal. So it's all dependent on whether we work with people who doesn't know anything. Their God reveals His grace, and then He teaches them the correct way. Here, where you're supposed to know His grace, He said, first come in line, align your life, do the right things, then the healing will stay with you. Some people mix up God's grace. God is a gracious God. He always does more than what we ask. He wants to give us more than what you even can think of. God's love is so great, so high, so deep, your brain cannot even comprehend how God feels about you. He loves you so much. If you can just f see how God loves you and how He feels about you, you will never think something negative about yourself ever again. God values you so much. You are so special, beautiful from His perspective. He made you. You are so special. And still, you know, we, our brains are telling us, I'm oh, not good enough, you know, I will not make it, I'm not beautiful. If you can just see yourself from God. All right, number 16, facts regarding healing. Less than 10% people receive a measure of healing during mass healing services. And that's a fact. You can go to any mass healing service. You can go to Reinhard Bonker, I've been in, in some of the great men and observed that. And I, I'm not against that. It's great. God used that as a testimony to bring many people to Jesus. So it, it's right. We need to do it. When we are ministering to the crowds and God heals a few people, it's great. You can study Benny Hinn's ministry. I've been there at one of his latest ones. I've watched it. The amount of people coming and the amount that's being healed, it's less than 10%. It's great. It's great. I'm really glad that those less than 10% received some healing. But what we've discovered and what we need to realize, if we could take those same sick people and they can come into a, a body of Christ where they are prayed for by teams over a longer period, we might have up to 90% healing. Then it's not one superstar in front, but it's a team ministering to someone for hours, Days. If you watch people like Francis McNutt ministering healing, he, he always had a team with him, and his team is dedicated. They are there to pray until healing comes forth. And they've seen mighty miracles. And he has a church in New York, wrote a lot of books on healing, 
And uh, the testimonies are so powerful. And, and a lot of healing only come forth. They will start praying for someone and nothing happens. And they keep on praying, 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 praying. And while they're praying, because they're always a team, they listen. Holy Spirit, what you say? What you say? Then someone says, I feel uh, you need to forgive your father. Is that right? Yes. All right, forgive your father. We pray, 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 pray. Nothing still happened. And, and the word of God comes again. And we feel you have to break the relationship with that person that you are. That's not godly. We need to cut that. All right, let's cut that. And we keep listening to the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the healing starts getting through. There's a change coming. Say, for instance, it's a growth. I've seen growth just disappear as you pray. Suddenly the growth started now to shrink and disappear. And then it stops. (laughs) It's not finished yet, but it stopped. Then it tells you there's something more that we need to deal with. Pray, pray, pray. Listen to the Holy Spirit, Lord. What more? There's still resentment against so-and-so. Right. You need to forgive that person before your full healing will come. Forgive, what? there's a full healing coming through. So as a team, we can listen, we minister, we counsel you while we're busy giving you the healing. And that's the power of team ministry, that we can touch and minister far more than one single. If I'm in front and you come out for healing, I cannot be as effective than a team that's around you that pray for a while that listen and lay hands, because the gift of healing is being in many of us. I might have one aspect of the gift of healing, and you might have another aspect of the gift of healing that I don't have. So if you pray with me, we will have double effect. If I have four, six people praying with me for the same person, and we all have a gift of healing that's operating on a different level, we might have tremendous effect in this person's life. So it's not just one superstar. It's about the body of Christ healing people. And so normally when we pray, get people with you. Get more to lay hands on. There's people having a gift of healing that don't even realize they have the gift. But the moment they lay their hands on people, things happen. Some have a gift for back pain. Whenever you pray for someone's back, it's, it's getting straight. Some people have faith for headaches. When you pray for a headache, it's out. Some people will pray for ears and eyes and different things. And it's interesting how people develop faith for one area. It's as if they have a stronger gift in that area than on other areas. So whatever God has graced you with gift, develop that. And uh, what you enjoy to do. That's why team ministry is so vital that we understand and do it. Soaking prayer. What is soaking prayer? We find it in the Bible. I've mentioned two names there, Francis McNutt, John Wimber, that, that made it very popular and very uh, understandable in the today's life. Uh, John Wimber is already with God. He's, he, he really introduced a lot of ministry of healing in the world and uh, a great man of God that brought a lot of good theology, restored a lot of integrity to the whole charismatic movement. Uh, in terms of the ministry of healing, lo- brought a lot of good, solid foundation in that because there was a lot of flaky people going around and, and saying things about healing but was not solid in the Word. Uh, in the Bible, we find some examples where they've done soaking. Uh, um, now, what is soaking? It means that you do something for a while. It's not just I pray now, but I might pray again and again and again for you. Because one question we always have is, may I pray more than once for you? Can I pray a second time, a third time, a fourth time? And you must understand prayer is like medicine, if I can compare it. You know, if you're coughing, I'm giving you cough medicine every so-called two, three hours. Because I want you to get healthy. The same prayer is like giving you medicine. The more I give you, the quicker you can be healed. And a lot of healing comes through after two, three times of praying. So don't think it's, it's a sign of unbelief if you pray a second time. You just keep on praying. Even if you confess your healing a thousand times, you keep on confessing it. You call it in. You claim it. You hold on to it. Healing is mine. Devil, you're not going to keep me sick. I don't receive the sickness. Healing is mine. And you receive that healing in your body. Every area of your, you just confess it. If it doesn't manifest now, you keep on confessing. You never doubt. 
Even if you walk around for a year or three years of the same disease, you keep on confessing, God is my healer. I trust him for complete restoration in my body. Now here's a few examples in the Bible. Mark 8. When he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand. Now Jesus took this blind man by the hand and took take him away from the crowd and let him out of the town. And when he had split, spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and make him look up. And he was restored and saw everything clearly. Now this is a good example where Jesus had to pray the second time. Now that gives me some peace that I can pray three and four and five times. Jesus, now obvious what Jesus did here was very unique. He took this guy out of the town. So maybe, I don't know if his disciples walked with him. He took this guy away from all the people. Maybe for the sake he didn't want the people to be around. And then he spit in his eyes. <laughs> How would you like if we have a spitting ministry tonight? <laughs> and a few times Jesus used spit spit on the floor mix it with the ground soil put it on the eyes of the people now is the healing in the soil no the healing might be more in the spit because it comes from Jesus his anointing but that Jesus using mud mean of all things to put on your eyes. Just imagine if we have a bucket of mud here. Every Sunday I say, those who have eyesight problems, please come. <laughs> and I just put it on all the eyes. You know, we might have a lot of members. <laughs> or none. <laughs> the spitting pastor. <laughs> Now, Jesus used interesting ways. And that actually tells us that there's no rules in this because he might tell us to do something that no one else has done before. And uh, in Elijah, he, he laid on that little boy. That's not very acceptable for a great big man to lay on a little de dead little boy. And he did that and raised that boy. So the Bible is full of funny ways of healing people. So the key is not, you know, am I going to do the same? The key is, Lord, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> Smith Wigglesworth, a few times, hit people with the fist in their stomach. I saw some others the other day also doing that. Actually, I saw other guy kicking someone the other day. Instead of laying hands, he laid a feet on him. Now, it's fine, you know, if it works, it's fine. If you have cancer in your stomach and intense pain, I come and hit you in your stomach. And, you, and I hit you and you fall out there. Everyone will be angry, you know. But if this guy gets up and he's completely healed, they will forget about my hitting and they will praise God. Because God was using that. And that's what happened with Smith Wigglesworth. A few times in front of people. Even in, one was a woman, a lady. He hit her full power in her stomach. And she fell. People shout. You know? <laughs> and they pick her up and she was completely healed. So uh, whatever you do, make sure it's from God. You know, if, if, if there's a funeral busy happening, and I come and I open the the coffin, you know, and gripped the guy and said, stand up and walk. It does not work. I'll, people will kill me. But if it works, I will be on the front page. So make sure whatever you do, it's, it's God. And sometimes you're not sure. But we learn to hear his voice, to do the right thing at the right time. We must understand his voice. 2 Kings 4 verse 31. 
<clears throat> now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid his staff on a face. Now we've read this portion. Let's summarize it quickly. That's the story of Elijah who laid on that little boy. And we see in this portion that he laid on that boy and he got off, up and off and he walked up and down in the room and then he got on that boy again. And then only the boy sneezed seven times and he opened his eyes and was alive. Even here with, with him, the healing was not immediately. He had to repeat his prayer and laying on, he didn't lay hands, he laid his body on this guy. Mark 11, verse 20. And passing on early, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter reminding him, Rabbi, behold, the fig tree which you have cursed has withered away. And answering Jesus said, Have faith of God, for truly I say to you, now, this story we also read, if you have faith and not doubt, you can call, command the mountain to be lifted up and be cast into the sea, and so on. Now, out of this portion, what I want you to just understand, Jesus cursed the tree, and a few hours later they passed, and the tree was dead. So the effect of the curse took a few hours to show up. Now, in the same way, the blessing. When I bless you with healing, the effect of the healing might show only in two or three hours. I had it many times that I pray for people and they go home. And then the next day they said, you know, uh, I went home and, and suddenly I realized I'm healed. And they were not healed while they were here, but while they went home or at home, they, the, the healing came out. So it might take that, that moment or even that we pray again and again over your life. And uh, I've seen that. And it takes sometimes time that we are prepared to pray again and again and again for someone. And... Uh, I've seen it with a blind eye that, that, that opened once when I was praying. Um, the person's eye was completely gray. And we lay hands on that eye and pray for that eye. And then, you know, after a while, he said, all right, open. Can you see anything? And he said, I can see, you know, shadows. But the eye was a little bit darker, but still grayish. And we lay hands again and pray again. And when we lay, I took our hands off the, the pupil, the eye was coming back into the color. And I said, what can you see? He said, uh, I was seeing, he said, I can see movement. And we pray again. And we prayed about for an hour. And after an hour, he had about 80% visibility of that hour. And then we got a little bit tired of praying for an hour for the same eye. And uh, so we, we actually, the, the evening was so light, uh, we blessed him, he went home. So I, I, I trust that the healing continues in that eye. I didn't see the guy again, but I trust that it was just continuing. It just didn't stop at 80%, but that it, every time you pray, it might be more increase. I've seen it with growths. Remember one guy who had that terrible growth on his hand, and he was standing, and we prayed for that growth, and nothing happened in him immediately. And I prayed for other people. I come back and lay my hands on that and prayed again. And then I realized every time I come back, the growth was smaller. I lay my hand on it again and command this thing to wither and die and go away. Coming back, it was smaller. It took us a while, 20 minutes or so, and then it was completely gone. So we need to get into the habit of keep on praying. Remember, it's not about asking God, Lord, please come heal. Lord, please can heal. It's not for 30 minutes I ask the Lord to come and heal. Remember, I said healing is not prayer. Healing is action. I go and heal it. So I command that, that thing Wither and die. Go away. In the name of Jesus, I speak healing over this thing. And if my language, I don't know what to say, I switch over to praying in tongues in my spirit. I just lay hands on that sickness and I pray in the spirit. And even if I have to pray for an hour in the spirit, I keep on praying until I, I feel I've done what God wants me to do. Today, we want everything microwave. We want things to happen quickly. And if it doesn't happen immediately, we just don't care anymore. We think maybe God doesn't want to do it. Meantime, God is just testing your faith. Are you prepared to be patient and keep on praying? Then there's examples in the Bible, number 18, people who were not healed immediately. So that, that set us on ease. If you are not healed immediately, at least we have a few examples in the Bible of people who was not healed immediately, but after a while. They all got healed, but not in that moment. Um, one of them we already touched and talked about Timothy who had stomach pain and stomach problems. Uh, 
first one there is Epaphroditus, Philippians 2.25. Yet I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your mess messenger and he who ministered to me my wants, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, coming near death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow about upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, so that you may rejoice with you when you see him again, that I may be the less sorrowful. So this Philippian church has sent this guy Epaphroditus to Paul to bring things to him, to come and bring a message to him, to bless him. And while he was with Paul, he got sick. And then the message went back to them that they heard he was sick. And obviously he was very sick because it took weeks for the message to get there. And he was obviously sick not only for a moment but for days or weeks or months. So eventually he was healed and Paul was sending him back to his hometown, to his people. And this is the story about that. Now obviously we, we suppose Paul prayed for him every day and cared for him until he was well. And... Uh, so Paul was not afraid to say, this guy was with me, and actually he got sick while he was with me. Normally when you get to Paul, you're supposed to get well. In this case, this guy got sick. Timothy had stomach problems. Uh, Trophimus, in Acts 20, verse 4. And so Pater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristachus and Secundus of Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy and uh, Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia, these men going ahead, waiting for us at Troas. So he was part of the team that was working with uh, Paul. And then 2 Timothy 4 says, But Tro Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. So he was part of the team, and then the team left, and they couldn't take him with that to leave him there because he was still too sick. Now, most of the sickness in those days was stomach stuff. There's a lot of, you know, stomach things. Most of the deaths in those years were because of some stomach um, dysfunctional or poisoning of something you eat or so. A lot of things came from that. Today, the three main killers are um, heart disease, cancer, and sugar diabetes. Um, and obviously, there's others that's coming into the the, the pipeline also, those years, the number one was stomach disease. And when people died, it was mostly related to some stomach thing. All right, just to, to get you the image that uh, in the team of Paul, you also had to deal with it. Now Paul himself became sick, Galatians 4. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise of reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ Jesus. He said that he made connection with these people in Galatia while he was sick. And they did not reject him, but they treated him as an angel. So Paul was not immediately healed. So don't feel you have missed it if you are not immediately healed. Healing might take a moment. In Jesus' ministry, it says most people were immediately healed. Now we want to get there as the per perfected situation. We are not like Jesus yet. We are growing there. So if you have to pray a second time, if it takes a day or two to get healthy, it's fine. Uh, we want to get healed immediately. My wife prayed in this week for me, and I, I believe I was healed immediately. Um, in one moment, that fever left me, and I was immediately normal again. I hope I'm normal. My wife would say most of the time. <laughs> Healing and the power of God. You still awake? Without God's power and God's presence, we cannot heal. We need God to... to empower us, and, and you see it in this portion that the power of God was an operation, and even that's what we pray for today. 
Now a certain woman had the flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. Now that, that sounds very much like today. People suffering, spent all their money on physicians and still suffering. Um, unfortunately, the medical world are very expensive. Um, and even those days, when she heard about Jesus, he came behind him in a crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. So she was doing self-talk. She, that's a, we call it a faith confession. She was confessing her faith that if I touch, I will be healed. And exactly according to what she said, she got. That's the power of a faith confession. What you said is what you're going to get. And she put the faith in Jesus and she confessed what she believed that she will receive. Maybe she said that a hundred times before she touched him. If I touch him, I will be healed. If I touch him, I will be healed. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed after affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? So what I want you just to see in this is Jesus felt that power was going out of him. If you read the other portions in Matthew and Luke, the parallel portions, it it actually says the same. Jesus felt that unction or power was going out of him. So what we learn from that is the power of God is tangible. You can feel it. You can release it. You can receive it. So if I've got power of God in me, I can release it in such a way that you can feel it. I can feel it's going and you can feel it's coming. Now, it's not always like that, but that's many times like that. When we touch people, they feel power. They feel the burning sensation. They feel heat coming upon them. Some people start vibrating. Some people will just sense the peace of God coming. So the power of God can be tangible. You can feel it. It can be released. It can be received. Like this woman. She felt healing immediately. Jesus felt power going out of him. Let's go to the next one. Faith. And there's so many scriptures on faith. We can be busy with that for ages. But just a few. Matthew 8 verse 5 to 13. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but one only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I said to this one, go, and that one, go, and another, come. And he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And this guy is not a Jew, he's not a Hebrew. He was a centurion, and they were working for a Roman government. So he was an Italian, a Roman guy, being sent to Israel as a governor to operate this. He was part of the army, the Roman army, non-Christian, but he knew authority. Coming here to Jesus, and Jesus said, I've never seen such amount of faith. So faith lies very much in understanding authority, and, uh, and surrender to that authority. And when you understand authority and receive authority, as he said, just speak a word, my, my guy would be healed. He understood authority. In verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And the servant was healed that same hour. Just think, of the disciples standing here around Jesus. And Jesus turned to them and said, You know, guys, I've never seen such great faith in Israel. Actually telling the disciples, This guy has more faith than you. And therefore, you could receive more than you. Just by faith. And we are focusing now on faith. The role that faith is playing in your life. If you have little faith, you will receive little. If you have no faith, nothing. If you raise your faith and expectancy 
because faith is knowing God and expect what God is saying will happen, then great things will happen in your life. So you have to build up your faith. Your faith needs to grow. Even today, I pray that your faith will increase and multiply. Matthew 9 verse 20. Please stay with me. Don't allow your tiredness or anything steal your focus. Try to stay with the scriptures. Read with me. Underline. Try to get the scriptures to speak to you and receive from it as God is speaking to you out of that. And behold, a woman who had the flow of blood, and we've read the portion already for 12 years, came up behind him and touched him, the hem of his garment. And she, uh, and she said within herself, if only I could touch his robe, I will be whole. But turning and seeing her, Jesus said, Daughter, be comfort. Your faith has saved you. And the woman was saved from that hour. So this woman that we've mentioned already previously came with faith. Faith is being demonstrated by doing something. She went after Jesus. She reached out to him, touched him. Isn't that the same what you need to do? In the spirit, you need to touch him. In the spirit, you need to reach out. In the spirit, you need to confess like this woman, if only I can touch him, I will be healed. You better get the positive confession on your lips every day. If you have some condition that you are fighting, you better get the confession on your lips that Jesus can heal me. Jesus will heal me. I'm holding on to him. His healing will come forth. It must become your lifestyle, your confession daily. Mark 2 verse 5. When Jesus saw her faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. You remember this portion? We've read it also. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Now the focus on this is that first portion, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. And we already touched on that previously. That Jesus said that um, because of their faith, he told this boy, your sins are forgiven, take up your bed and walk. And he took up his bed and he walked. That was a great story. Let's go to Mark 5 verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. That was Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue who came to Jesus and they said his little girl was busy dying. And Jesus told him, do not be afraid, only believe. And that's a very strong word for you guys. I just sense God wants you to get that in your spirit. Do not be afraid. Only believe. Because the moment you doubt, you, you allow fear to come in your heart. Do not allow fear. Only believe. You can think this man was so desperate. My daughter is busy dying. And he wants this guy to come. He wants Jesus to come. And actually, on the way, as they were walking to his house, that is when that woman came and touched Jesus from behind. You know. So Jesus was spending some time with this lady while this Jairus was standing there. My, my daughter is busy dying, man. Let go of this woman. Let's go. And Jesus said, just don't fear. Just believe. And some of the scribes were, why, where am I? Now? And he permitted no one to follow them except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now that also tells us something. That when we pray for people, we need to get those who don't have faith out of the place. If you pray for someone and there's unbelievers around it, get the unbelievers out. Because they are stealing the faith and they're stealing the miracle. If we go to homes and places... And there's people that's really negative, unbelief. I ask them to just leave me alone with this person. And many times Jesus would go alone with someone because the unbelief of other people was stealing the miracle. You saw that in Nazareth. When Jesus was in Nazareth, because they didn't honor him, and honor he equals to faith, he couldn't heal the people. A lack of faith takes away the miracle. So even people with unbelief, we don't want them around us. Don't surround you with unbelievers. Especially when you're sick. You don't want these unbelievers around you. That feel pity on you. and You want people around you that has hope. And speak hope in you. That expect great things to happen. That applies to all things in life. Even your friends. Get rid of all the negative people in your life. You want people around you that has hope for great things to come. Some friends in my life that was always pessimistic, negative. I kicked them out of my life years ago. I see them now and then and just greet them. 
but I don't want those people because they're always complaining, negative, and I cannot share my dreams and hope to them because they would say, oh, Sarah, that's impossible. You can't do that. And you always have people like that. Um, and, and the enemy send them to you about anything you do, those who steal your faith. Get rid of them. All right. So Jesus only took these three strong men with him. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a, a Talmud and those who wept and wailed loudly. In those days, you could, you could get people, that was their job, to cry. You rent some weepers. They come and they wept, and they made a big noise at your house so that the whole city knows that there's death. And that was their, their job. Uh, even today, uh, in some of the African cultures, you get people, uh, they come specially to funerals to cry there, uh, and you actually rent some people to cry. Um, and and it, it's not, I mean, one of my friends have a very big funeral business in South Africa, and he, he, he actually rent out people who can cry for you. Uh, you can rent a limousine, you can rent, I mean, a tent for the stuff, your cow, you know, you do, chairs, everything. Uh, he can give you some of these girls that's marching with short dresses. And, uh, and he can give you a crowd that can cry for you. Uh, you can rent all of those, part of the rental deal. Um, all, all depends on what you want. And, um, and up, apparently it seems like here was some of them. They were weeping and wailing loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, so he, he chased them all out. He only kept those who have faith with him. He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita Kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I said to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years old at age, and, and they were overcome with great amazement. Delita Kumi. Um, faith, just keep on believing. And because your kept on believing, believe what Jesus was saying, he had the privilege of seeing the miracle of his child. Mark 6 verse 3. I've referred to this in Nazareth. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? They are referring to Jesus, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, and are not these sisters here with us? That's in Nazareth. And they were offended at him. So the people of Nazareth rejected Jesus. He was there. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among him, his own relatives and his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there. See that. It doesn't say he did not want to do mighty work. It said, he could not do any mighty work. He could not do a miracle there. Why? The next verse actually says that. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So the fact that they did not honor Jesus and accept who he was, was a sign of unbelief. And their unbelief actually created the atmosphere in that city that Jesus could not perform a lot of miracles, yield a few people. Your unbelief takes God's ability away to bring a miracle to you. God wants to heal. Jesus wanted to heal. And he walked out and he marveled. He was surprised of the unbelief of the city. And he couldn't heal them. He wanted to, but they couldn't because of unbelief. Are you still here? Are you receiving? What's the level of faith in your house? Can Jesus walk in there and do what he wants? Because you are open, receptive. Luke 17, 17. I think we are close to our coffee break, so just hang in a little bit. So Jesus answered and said, Where, where were, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine were there not only any found who, re, 
a return to give glory to God except this foreigner. And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Well, that was the, the, the guy who had leprosy. The ten, one of the ten who came back. And Jesus said, your faith. And now his faith was what? Why did Jesus say your faith? What did this guy do to, to show his faith? He came to honor Jesus and say thank you. And the fact that he came to worship, honor him, and say thank you, Jesus saw that as an act of faith. And now because of your faith, you are made complete. Not only healed, but complete. So your faith is being represented in your worship. In your honoring of God. I was just pre preaching recently on how to honor God. Because it comes out in the way you worship Him. And live with Him. Luke 18 verse 41. Saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to them, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. This guy's faith caused him to see. Let's quickly do some of the other scriptures on faith. We're nearly at the principle and we get closer to the end of our manual. And uh, there's some very important things still to come. But we're getting closer, so just hang in there. John 11, 40 said, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? That was when Lazarus was dead. And uh, this whole portion is about, you know, if you only believe, you will see the glory of God. Believe, I will raise him. And actually, Jesus cried later because of unbelief. If only you believe, you will see the glory of God. John 14, 14 verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, and that's the, the faith action, and that's where you and me are now. You believe in Jesus. The words that I do, will, the works that I do, he will also do, he will do also. And greater works than these, than these you will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, will, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's a wonderful blank check, Jesus said. Everything you ask in my name, I will do it for you. Because I'm going to the Father. So in this, we heard, for those who believe, we will do the same works and even greater. That's you. Me. Acts 3 verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. And whom you see and know, his name made firm. And the faith which came through him has given him this perfect soundness before you. Now this was a guy who was also crippled, who could walk now. And, uh, and it says, by the faith in the name. Whose name? The name of Jesus. He put his faith in Jesus, in himself as a person. He was made whole. Acts 14 verse uh, 9. And a man heard Paul speaking Paul observing him in, intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Seeing, see you see that, seeing that he had faith to be healed. Said that in a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. So here's a guy who was paralyzed. And Peter, uh, Paul was busy preaching. And as he was preaching, he saw this guy. And he saw faith on him. Do you know that your faith can become visible? And he saw faith on him and he said, because he saw the faith, he said, get up and walk. This guy jumped out of that, I don't know, they don't, didn't have wheelchairs those days, but he jumped out of his chair and run and walk and leap and jump. All right, let's go take a break. Call you back in 20 minutes. Walk around.